Jody asked me to speak on uh, the soils that occur at this site and talk about uh, natural soil aggregation and uh, how to build soil aggregation through soil biology and uh, kind of give a different twist uh, to what the whole field day is here today. Uh, most of it, what you're hearing about, will be tillage and trying to alleviate compaction and, and preparing a, a seed bed. Uh, I work in North Dakota as a, a soil scientist and I work with a lot of producers uh, that are actually no tillers and uh, work with conventional producers also. But really uh, look at biological systems and how you can improve uh, your soils and get maximum production. So. I'm going to talk about the, the natural soil itself, how it developed. So the, the soil developed under tall grass prairie. And you start looking at some of the plants that were here and the depth of rooting. It's incredible. Some of these things were down 10 feet. You know, really complex root structures. You had a big plant community of all different types of plants. Uh, a lot of biomass at the surface, but a lot of biomass in the soil itself. Think of all those different root structures. About 70% of what uh, crops now, wheat, corn, uh, soybeans, they exude about 70% of their carbon into the soil and feed, feed the soil biology in the soil. And uh, that, through that process, we can get some aggregation built into the soil. But these soils uh, obviously are nice, deep, dark soils up here. This is a pond set soil. Uh, the type location, we call it, uh, where they first initially mapped the soil was over by Brookings, South Dakota. Uh, it's a fine, silty soil. It's uh, formed in glacial drift, which means the soil uh, was deposited here by the glacier, but may have been reworked a little bit by water, either through lake activities, or could have been a lake here, or there could have been water sorting by running water. Uh, I would prefer to think, because it's fine silty that, and there, there isn't a lot of rock in it, that this was actually kind of a little bit of a lake plain. Could have been an ice-walled lake plain where there's ice all around it and uh, the soil settled out and that's how you got the texture of fine silty. So most of it's silty clay loams that are in this, uh, this field here. I think there are fine textured soils where uh, lower in the landscape. So, Typically in a, in a pond set soil, we have an A horizon. Um, now Jeff's done some deep tillage, but uh, I really couldn't pick up on it. I was doing this kind of in the dark last night, so uh, I didn't see any disturbance at a deeper depth. So what I said AP was about six inches thick. So that's kind of his, his, uh, his disturbance uh, through tillage. And then an A horizon where last night, at least I couldn't see any disturbance uh, so it's just kind of an over thickened A horizon. Then we have a BW. BW is kind of like the A, but it's still kind of like the, the C material that's way down underneath it. So uh, it shows that there's weathering going on. It's called a cambic horizon. Uh, it's a process of weathering in the soil and uh, it's kind of taking carbon and, uh, and uh, through translocation and, and other weathering processes, uh, starting to weather that. So it's called a B horizon. And then finally on the bottom, it's a BK horizon. Our soils are naturally pretty fertile up here. We don't have to add a lot of lime normally or a lot of to the soil because we naturally have a lot. This is hydrochloric acid. This is how soil scientists test for uh, lime. Uh, they take the soil and they just uh, drop the acid on the soil surface. And if you see that reaction, uh, you got calcium carbonate. So when soil scientists map the soil, they would have used acid down through the profile to try to determine where that uh, carbonate level is. So you can see that reaction. We'll talk a little bit about soil structure. Uh, first of all, those tall grass prairie plants, I mean, they, they put a lot of carbon into the soil, but they also, also function in creating soil structure too because you had uh, soils that were essentially massive after the glaciers left here as this mass of geologic material and they had to weather over time. So 
Um, I don't know the history of glaciation in this area. I just know in North Dakota it was about 10,000 years ago. Um, if you pull a soil, you can get large prismatic structure. Those are like prisms that are in the soil. So it's hard to see when they're wet right now, but that's an actual structure in the soil. It's a vertical structure, which is great for water movement, allows water to penetrate, uh, allows roots to penetrate along those uh, structures. Of the if you want rapid infiltration under when, the, when it's not field capacity or not saturated, then by creating good porosity in the soil, you can get more rapid water infiltration to recharge lower uh, depths in the soil. So you got to have good aggregation at the surface to, for that to happen. If you get collapse uh, soil structure at the surface, obviously you get crusting and then more rapid runoff. You got good porosity surface entry pores and good uh, porosity in the aggregates between the aggregates, uh, then you can get more rapid water infiltration under drier conditions or uh, non-saturated conditions. So we have natural soil structure, we have prismatic structure in that uh, down all the way down into this part of the soil profile and we can have those prisms up here too. Naturally that soil will fall out kind of prisms, they break about apart pretty easily but uh, you're going to have prisms. One thing we're doing in North Dakota with a few producers, uh, to deal with some of the deep soil compaction is uh, we're actually using biological means to correct that soil compaction. Much like the native prairie, we can alter or manage the plants that we use to uh, create that porosity and break up soil compaction that's in the soil. And that's mainly what uh, I think Jody wanted me to hit on is, is there are other means, biological means, that you can actually um, work with uh, soil biology, work with plant plants to uh, create, an, create a system that has better porosity and better water infiltration. So we've used cover crops in North Dakota in different situations. Uh, I always get the question, well, how do you get cover crops in a corn-soybean rotation? And I know a few people have experimented with flying on radish seed, rye seed. Uh, this year actually probably would have been one of the better years to do it uh, because of the moisture conditions we have at the soil surface. Some of the issues you have with flying on cover crops is that dry fall where you just don't get the growth you want to get. Um, North Dakota, we've worked with producers, they've, they've taken uh, old uh, row planters and they modified them and now they're planting cover crops at about V4 stage of the corn and they're interseeding the cover crops between 30 inch rows of corn. That cover crop sits there till about fall when the corn uh, starts to senesce, starts to dry down canopy starts to open, that's when those cover crops really take off. Cover crops like uh, the brassicas, they're very frost tolerant. They'll keep growing down to about 18 degrees. So they're growing these cover crops uh, well into November. Sometimes we've seen them grow into December in North Dakota. You're a little longer growing season here. So um, these are excellent tools other than just using steel to correct some of your compaction problems that you, that you might have. We have to talk about freeze-thaw activity in soils. Um, anybody know how deep freeze-thaw activity actually loosens up soil? Well, the research would say about five inches. So uh, the combine went down here. You can see there is a little bit of compaction right at that soil surface. It's compacted, lost some pore space, comes out as a larger block of soil. Uh, freeze thaw will work down to about five inches. And there are some people that thought, well, freeze thaw actually alleviates compaction to a deeper depth, but it doesn't. It's that daily fluctuation, probably when you get to March and temperature, where you get freeze 
during the night, thaw during the day, loosens those soils up and, and alleviates some of that compaction in the surface. Subsoil compaction, naturally you're going to alleviate some of that through uh, shrink swell. So when the soil's dry, they shrink and you'll see cracks in your soil. Uh, if you go to the Red River Valley where uh, clay content's very high, you can get two inch cracks in those type of soils and I'm sure some of you guys farm those type of soils. But if they don't ever dry out, then they don't ever crack, right? So um, that's one way uh, naturally that soils alleviate uh, subsoil compaction. The other one would be just root structures. Look at the root structure that's in your cropping system. Uh, do you have roots that are penetrating deep into the soil profile? How many of you uh, have alfalfa in your rotation at all? Is there anybody? Okay. You guys ever notice that that helps your compaction issues? Yeah. So you got that big tap root in an alfalfa plant that's penetrating deep into the soil profile. And then that uh, root decays and it leaves pore space uh, for the other roots to grow. So you go back to a corn soybean rotation. I've been in some fields where I've found corn roots going down, alfalfa, falling alfalfa roots down six feet in a soil pit. So, yeah, there's other different biological means of uh, fixing some of these issues that uh, Jody wanted me to cover other than using steel. Um, if you look through the soil profile, you can see where old roots uh, actually filled up, root channels filled up with topsoil material. Some of that may be uh, earthworm activity, I'm not sure. But if you go back to what the uh, plant community was under native conditions, uh, there was probably a lot different root structure and some of that's probably preserved down lower in the profile. So you got uh, lighter material up here too, so that would probably indicate earthworm activity where your earthworms are uh, passing it through their gut and end up with lighter material up above and darker material down below. If you look at this diagram, conceptual diagram of uh, soil aggregates. Soil aggregates are formed not by tillage, but by biology, soil biology. If you look at this concept diagram, these are microaggregates, polysaccharides that are given off by bacteria form those microaggregates. The macroaggregates are formed by uh, glomalin, which is a substance that's exuded out of the soil fungi, which is uh, illustrated by the, the green strands in here. So to get macroaggregates in the soil, um, you really have to reduce the amount of disturbance that's in the soil. Because if you have these filaments growing in the soil and you do a lot of tillage, it destroys the filaments. They have to grow back to create that macro aggregation again. This is supposed to be a microscopic view of uh, filaments of uh, fungi. All the green you see here, that's a dye color for the glomalin that's exuded out of that soil fungi. This is work done by Chris Nichols when she was at Mandan ARS. And that's what the aggregates look like uh, under a low power microscope. So soil biology is very important when it comes to forming the soil aggregates. If you look at uh, the aggregates we have in this soil, other than uh, where there's been some Traffic, you know, it has some fairly decent aggregates that are in the soil. So why is aggregation important? Protection of the soil from erosion. If you got large aggregates, are they less susceptible to wind erosion, water erosion? Yeah. Protection of carbon, less carbon loss in a soil like that. Porosity. That's how you build porosity in soils is through aggregation. And uh, at the surface, you're going to have aggregates like this that's going to allow for water infiltration to flow through those pores and uh, get lower in the profile. Anybody have any soils that look like that? 
That's horizontal compaction. Think of water movement uh, down through the soil. Yeah, if you get the platy structure like that right below the plow pan, or the cultivation layer, uh, you're going to have a hard time trying to move water through that soil profile. Now this is a soil that's uh, had multiple different crop rotations on it. You got high earthworm activity. When I looked at uh, Jeff's soil here, he had a few earthworms, not a lot. Um, some of our no-till fields, I, I've done worm counts where we've had up over 70 earthworms per cubic foot of soil versus a conventional tilled soil next to it had about eight. So you can use soil biology to help you in creating porosity and creating soil aggregation in the soil. If you do a lot of tillage, earthworms don't like that. So you'll lose your earthworms. I have a couple demonstrations uh, to show the difference uh, between aggregate stability. These are just uh, smaller peds of soil. If you look at that one, you can see there's a lot of plant material in it, a lot of earthworm activity, a lot of pores. This one has been cultivated. This one's no-till. Uh, these come from half a mile apart up by Jamestown, where I'm from. There's a lot of biological activity in this soil versus the one that's in the conventional. Not that there isn't any biology in here, it's just it's not the right biology. Uh, this is from a soil that's been cultivated about four times because it was in prevent plant. So this is the cultivated soil, and this is the uh, aggregate slake demonstration. This is the no-till soil. This is right at the surface. Okay. Because that soil fungi isn't in that uh, soil system on that conventional tillage since it's been tilled about four times this year, you can see the aggregates start slaking off. The large peds start slaking off rather rap rapidly. As air replaces the, uh, or water replaces the air in these peds, uh, exerts a force on them, and it's kind of a demonstration of how stable these aggregates are. This is the no-till, and that's the conventional till. Now what would happen with that conventional till one is, uh, as that slakes apart, you get raindrop impact, then you would plug up the pore space, and you get more runoff and less infiltration. And we can demonstrate that over here. Um, this is the no-till field. Now this is a rather rapid rainfall. This is one is simulating one inch of rainfall, but it's going to fall in about two minutes. We have another rainfall simulator that would probably put it on in about the right amount of time. But it's supposed to illustrate rapid. We get rapid rainfall during the summer. Uh, what can happen to these soils. So you're still getting some runoff from the no-till, but you're getting water infiltration. If you can see behind it, there's water percolating through the soil because it has more porosity in it. Uh, the water that does run off is clear. For Sistab, no plant residue on it at all. This is a conventional soil, been tilled four times. And I got these saturated now. They were dry to begin with, but now they're saturated. Uh, so it would simulate probably a rainfall after you already had a couple inches of rainfall. So you got weak aggregate stability, which leads to more turbidity in the water, which uh, lead to some water quality issues and loss of topsoil due to water erosion. Versus the stable aggregates under the no-till system, uh, you don't lose any soil.